everyone, welcome back to the Earth on Survival Guide, the podcast for all disciplines, paths, players, and game masters. With your questers, Josh and Dan, I am Dan. I am Josh. And on today's podcast, we will be discussing all things tyrannical and metallurgical, and that'll be explained in a bit or so, uh, as we talk about the actual holders of trust. We meant to get to it last time, but ran out of time. But otherwise, if you have any questions for us about anything you've heard in the last 128 episodes, or anything we're going to talk about tonight, or how to use the holders of trust, please contact us at edsgpodcast at gmail.com, or call and leave us a voicemail. You can find that on anchor.fm. So... The Holders of Trust, this is one of those essays that got to branch out into its whole other separate books, <laughs> really, because of Iopos and Empty Thrones. So this actually has two more books about kind of what's going on in the essay we're going to talk about today from the original first edition, Secret Societies of Barsave. Yeah, the Holders of Trust are... Not to be trifled with. <laughs> they are, yeah, well, they are not to be trifled with. Spoiler warning uh, coming in... We're going to try and minimize the amount of fourth edition status of things a little bit because there are books related to them that we don't necessarily want to spoil. I mean, all of these Secret Societies episodes have been yeah. kind of spoilery in, in greater or lesser extents, but this one is especially so. Yes, because the Denerastus family and Iopos and the Holders of Trust are pretty heavily intertwined with the ongoing story of Barsave, going all the way back to Prelude to War, the first epic from first edition. And this essay and their appearance in Secret Societies is the first real look at them in any kind of depth that appeared once they were sort of revealed as they actually are something that we need to worry about in terms of a potential threat. Absolutely. They had been kind of referenced in a couple of places, but for the most part, laid low until all of a sudden, bam, they mean business. Yeah, because this, uh, this Secret Society's book was published in 1997. So this is only a 25-year-old spoiler, but the <laughs> – I'm teasing, I'm teasing. Well, I know that there are people who are new to the game. I know yes. there are players like game masters who may be long term fans, but are getting new groups together and mm -hmm. want to run their groups through the original storyline, like yeah. starting back before the landing of the triumph and playing through either, you know, adapting some of the classic adventures for fourth edition. Yeah. Or like trying to, to, you know, weave some of those events into their own game, because it is a really compelling story that player characters can get involved with and care about characters that arise and whatnot. Yes. And kind of build up and have a real epic kind of situation going on there. Mm -hmm. So, again, we will be talking about stuff that happened sort of in the history of the setting and some deep lore aspects of things and events that might have happened in previous source books and adventures, be warned, we will be more than many of the other organizations. This one is a lot more intertwined with published adventure and campaign materials than some of the others have been. Agreed. So we'll try and just keep this to the holders themselves and not so much on the Denerastus clan which you can read all about in Iopos and Empty Thrones. So we'll leave that alone. Not that you can talk about the Holders of Trust <laughs> without talking about the Denerastus to a certain extent. Yes. Because the Holders of Trust are the mechanism by which the Denerastus family maintains their hold on the people of Iopos yep. and also tries to extend their control and operate their plots in bar save and possibly even lands beyond. Oh, and their information gathering network. So it's, it's yeah. quite, ex quite extensive. So yeah, we've talked about in some of the previous episodes, like for example, the songbirds um, yep. we've talked about uh, the, the force of the eye, Garlthic's network. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of other, we talked about um, the messengers uh, from Mystic Paths. Yes. Which is a very like similar kind of 
organization, a, a secret society or a group that is a an intelligence network, but the holders of trust are more than just an intelligence network. They are perhaps even more insidious and powerful in their way than any of those others. I was trying to think about this. We haven't talked about the Eye of Thrall yet. No. We haven't talked about the Life Rock Rebellion yet. Nope, that's next. You know, I'm like trying to think of the other ones. So like, oh no, we haven't actually talked about those yet. Yeah, we had a couple of spy networks involved. So there's uh, we've right, right, right. three spy networks. So this is like the fourth one. Because... Oh yeah, well, I mean, look, <laughs> ultimately, I, I don't think it's possible to have political conflict. You can't have rival powers yeah. operating in an area without espionage and intelligence. Mm -hmm. That's just kind of a given. Yeah, I think the Earth on Journal number three or four, something like that, actually had come up with somebody came up with the uh, discipline, the spy. I remember it. I don't know if it was good or not. I just remember it being there. So, yeah, I, I vaguely recall that. I haven't looked yeah. at those in a dog's age. <laughs> exactly. So anyway, as the expression goes. Totally. Uh, uh, so the holders of trust really is three different levels of, I can't say employees, but, but more uh, information gathering and bodyguards slash enforcers, police, I mean, all kinds of things. So let's, let's kind of break them down into the way that they are. So there is an official police force in IOPOS, and that's one level of the holders of trust. And they serve, and obeying is their duty. And they make their blood oath to one, Ul, Denurastus, and two, the city of Iopos. So they are sworn fealty to the leader first and the city second. So they do his well, bidding. Well, yes. The reason yes. being, and again, this is where you need to talk about the Denurastus. Yes. Because in in one respect, there is no real difference between the figurehead, in this case, Ul, um, at least as of the sort of first edition timeline of things. Yeah. And the city itself. Mm -hmm. Iopos is in some ways a city and a culture founded on and devoted to a cult of personality. Mm -hmm. I used the term fascist in the previous episode talking yeah. about them. And it is kind of appropriate. Mm -hmm. If you think about any kind of tyrannical rule led by an individual, strong a force of personality, a strong man in whatever form that may take. Yeah. That's what we're looking at here is that, yes, they are loyal to Ul first because Ul is Iopos. Mm -hmm. Within the, the beliefs of the citizens, yeah. the city would not exist without Ul and the Denerastus forebears who saved them from the scourge, whatever the actual truth of that might be, it has been long enough that this sort of indoctrinated culture has risen up. I mean, you look at stories that come out about North Korea, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But plenty of other examples, both present day and historical. Uh, we will try not to belabor those points over much. No, if you, uh, I literally finished a book two days ago called Strong Men by Ruth ben Giat, and it's from Mussolini to the present day about uh, these authoritarian rulers. And we're going to talk about Ul, who's an authoritarian ruler. So yes. This is quite a, a coincidence of timing. Or at least who was an authoritarian ruler. Ah, is that a spoiler? Uh, that's a little bit of a spoiler. A little bit of a spoiler. A fourth edition spoiler. <laughs> it is a fourth edition spoiler. It is a minor spoiler only because we announced it pretty big when it happened. Yeah, Totally. Uh, and yes, there's only two books but. about it. So, yes. Uh, but the, uh, so there are three levels of the holders of trust. And we'll go with, the, we'll start with a basic level first, and that is the copper branch. And their theme is loyalty. Actually, you know Sorry. what? Let's back I, up. I think, yeah, let's back up because you mentioned earlier the police force. Yeah. And that is the most public mm. facing Fair. view. That is the face of the holders of trust that visitors from outside Iopos would be familiar with and might believe Fair. is 
what all that the holders are. So why don't we talk about them first, that and then sense. we'll expand into the others and say, this is what outsiders see, Yes, but here's more what's going on under the surface. Absolutely. So the holders of trust that Josh is talking about is called the silver branch. This is the whole thing's metallurgical. These are all named after uh, certain metals. So the silver branch, their main theme is to maintain order. They are there to be a constant to be relied upon by the populace and by the Denerastus clan. So they are there to make sure that everything is kept the way it's supposed to be kept. The populace is kept there. Crime doesn't happen the way they don't want it to happen. Uh, they are also, by the way, this is the city guard. So right. otherwise what's known as the, the police force in Iopos. And they are there to aid in defense of Iopos against all who would destroy it, internal or external. Whoever says, whoever Ul says, is going to destroy it. So it could be an internal threat. They're they're also effectively the the standing army. Yes. There there is not yeah, again, we're talking about societies that are superficially modeled on a medieval dark ages, like mm-hmm. pre- quote unquote modern policing idea yeah. yeah that there is not any real difference between police and military no no again trying to avoid current states of affairs current states of affairs <laughs> so the silver branch are the visible police slash guard slash standing army force they are yeah. the ones that would be mustered if there were an attack on the city. They are the ones that patrol the streets, you know, making sure that laws are followed. They would be the ones to deal with troublemakers. In much like there are guards in the halls and Kingdom of Thrall yeah. that would be the ones that sort of get involved in, in those kind of aspects of things. The but, difference is, in Thrall, the city guard brings them before like a magistrate and there might be a trial. In Iopos... The Silver Branch, the city guard, the core of the Apple's military is judge, jury, punisher, executioner, take your pick. They do judge it dread. on the spot. Yeah, they're, they're your judge dread. Exactly. I was going to use the exact same thing. Uh, and by the way, the Silver Branch is so loyal, they are not swayed by bribes or threats. Yeah, that's an interesting take on things. It's actually common in authoritarian societies yeah. for corruption and bribery to be the way that things actually get done, that a, a little bit of grift, a little bit of bribery and a little bit of corruption helps grease the wheels of society. But it's a testament in a way to the level of control and the magical control that mm-hmm. the Denerastus hold over the city in general, but over the holders of trust in particular. Yeah. So when the the player characters enter the city or come across the city or try and get into the city, um, the Silver Branch, as, as, as Josh said, the, the, the roving patrols, the city guard and the military all kind of rolled up in one. The Silver Branch travel in threes. So there's a triad walking around. So just expect if you're a player character walking into Iopos or near Iopos, you'll come across the silver branch in a group of three almost at all times. And they have a horn. They can call reinforcements and, you know, like one to eight combat rounds if something breaks out because, you know, it might just break out. So there might be more usually arriving in, in, you know, three, so three, six, nine silver branch uh, around in there. So that's, as Josh said, the face that you will come across more often than not. They're the public face of the holders of trust. There are two other branches. Which one you want to cover next? Well, I think the next one that we would... Actually, branches. I'm sorry. Yeah, the the next one that I think that we should cover is the other one that operates within the city, for the most part. Uh, And that is the copper branch. That's the one you were going to start off with. But the copper branch is... Where the Silver Branch are the soldiers in uniform out on the streets projecting the force of the Denerastus, projecting mm-hmm. the image of Iopos as a city, projecting that strength and that image. The Copper Branch are the secret police. 
they're not secret police like the way you would think of, say, perhaps like the KGB or something like that. No. But they are the network of spies and informants, not on foreign powers. We'll get to that. Oh, yeah. They are the network of spies and informants within the city. It is the way that the denerastics exert control upon their own citizenry by yes. having agents that are keeping tabs on their fellow citizens and mm -hmm. reporting any dissent or swaying or potential disloyalty or potential corruption or graft or anything along those lines. Yeah. These are the, yeah, these, these are not, they are not in uniform. They could be anyone and they generally sort of operate in cells and uh, a, a particular copper branch member might be tasked with keeping an eye on a particular neighborhood or some individuals within an area and they will keep an eye on them and and pass on reports to their higher ups but it is a very almost resistance cell type based structure in that the members of the copper branch might know a couple of other members of the coppers and they would know like the their direct report and whatnot but they don't know the whole membership or anything like that. And that breeds and can breed a certain degree of paranoia. I kind of want to draw parallels to the Soviet era, especially if you talk about um, the John le Carré novels yeah. or Catch-22 or stuff like that, where you're dealing with like the really intricate, but really almost satire levels of intrigue and spying and double crossing and yeah. stuff like that, as opposed to the sort of heroic depictions that you might have of intelligence agents and whatnot. This is a lot more like paranoia and backstabbing. And this is the level at which bribery and corruption and stuff like that is a lot more likely to take hold. Yeah. Because... When you have this kind of power over your fellow citizens, you can leverage that to your advantage, but you also need to be careful not to do too much of it, because if you draw too much attention, then somebody else is likely to look at winning points with those higher up by taking you down. Yeah, these are the, the people who turn their neighbors in for doing something against the Denerastis clan. And so the, the phrase around town is, uh, common as coppers. Because it really could be anybody or everybody who is reporting to their rumor network, higher ups, about who's doing what, why, and when, where, and all that fun stuff. And so this is the the copper branch, you know, they don't have any display of badge or insignia. These are all plain clothed people who are just loyal to the point where they're going to report anything that they find, you know, suspicious. And that's pretty much it. So these the copper branch would turn their neighbors in. Even though you've known them for 10 or 15 years, doesn't matter. You finally do something suspicious, you get turned into the clan, and maybe the Silvers will come knocking. The other thing that makes it a little bit difficult at times to tell when you are dealing with the coppers is that there are plenty of IOPEN citizens who are not members of the coppers who are just as equally willing yes. to inform on their neighbors and turn things in. There is some activity like there are some agents of the coppers that are stationed in other parts of bar save and do pass along intelligence and information mm -hmm. but they are not as thick on the ground as they yeah. are within iopos itself and the coppers of course also pay attention to any foreigners any visitors within the city uh, in fact pay uh, particular attention to them because foreigners are often the ways by which trouble finds its way into the city, or at least what the Denerastis consider to be trouble. Absolutely. My, fa my favorite quote I got from uh, the book I told you about is that authoritarian rule, in this case, the Denerastis clan of Iopos, erodes trust and authenticity between people, hence the copper branch doing what it does. Had to share. Uh, so there's two more to go. Yeah, yeah. But the existence of the coppers really informs the Iopan culture and the way that people live in Iopos. 
kind of talks about this in in the essay in Secret Societies yeah. because citizens of Iopos need to be willing to freely talk about their lives and personal affairs because keeping secrets could be seen as suspicious as suspicious as you have something to hide as <laughs> you know what is it that you are are hiding yeah but they also at the same time need to be very careful about what they actually are saying because a wrongly placed word could lead to you know a knock at the door um, mm-hmm. From the silvers or whatever. Yeah. Very fun for the game master to play all the NPCs, though. <laughs> potentially. Potentially. One of the things that could really be interesting, There, there's some difficulty that could be had in terms of playing I-open characters. Mm-hmm. Because certainly some of the others that we're going to be talking about here are are very definitely villains and bad guys. You know, in much like the same way, it could be kind of difficult to play Theron agents, True. depending on what your game is like and your approach to things and whatnot, because there are some aspects of their culture that are just bad. But I am also reminded of games like, in particular, Paranoia, mm-hmm. the classic sort of satire comedy game that perhaps is at its best when it is a dark, almost black comedy. Mm -hmm. You know, again, I like, you know, kind of refer to like Catch-22 and and stuff like that. That kind of aspect of things could inform how you would either run a game where the player characters are going into Iopos for some reason, or might be playing, you know, doing a little bit of a game where you're playing uh, citizens of Iopos that might need to end up trying to be heroic within this authoritarian in its own way kind of broken society totally so onto the gold branch so we had copper you have silver now we have gold and the gold branch is probably about a hundred or so total members uh they exemplify success and as far as the generosity clan is concerned they are all adepts some magicians mm-hmm. are in there these are the elite spies who operate outside iopos but report on the on the movers and shakers and back to the clan, yeah. Yeah, there are some Copper Branch members, as I said, that operate in various locations, but they are basically feeding information to a Gold Branch member that is kind of in charge of, of their... Yeah. Um, Jada Denerastis, uh, the individual who was ultimately responsible for the assassination of King Varilus III. Uh, spoilers. Well, was is a gold branch member. The vast majority of gold branch members are actual members of the Denerastis family itself. Yeah. Distant uh, nieces and nephews. Second and third cousins removed. Second and third cousins and so <laughs> forth. But basically all members of almost nearly all of them are members of the Denerastis clan itself. Yeah. They are sent out and to greater or lesser extent allowed to operate within the area that they have been assigned to, and they will come up with their own plans and schemes and whatnot, ultimately for the furtherance of I open control of bar save overall, because that is the ultimate goal long term of the Denerastus uh, would be is basically to dominate bar save. But the gold branch members are generally high circle adepts, not uncommonly multidiscipline. Yeah. Journeymen at least, but frequently like high journeyman or, or, or low warden. These are campaign level opponents dealing with the machinations of a gold branch member or a gold branch cell that is operating in an area could be, you know, the focus of a campaign. And Empty Thrones, essentially, many of the story arcs in that book are dealing with the plots involved with Gold Branch members. Yeah, because most of those uh, disciplines under the Gold Branch are going to be magicians because the Denerestis clan are practicing magicians. If there are non-familial disciplines in there, they're mostly thieves, scouts, troubadours, warriors, whatever not, just to fill out the ranks. Um and 
those are recruited from the silver branch. So if you do really good as a silver branch, you might get recruited to be in the gold branch and, you know, change your profession now to being a professional spy. Just one of those things. But the yeah. other interesting thing about the gold branch is that this is the branch that is practicing trading partners with House Ishkarat. Yes. House Ishkarat has a very close relationship with the Denerastus. That's a relationship that has not been extensively explored either in first edition or in later supplements, other than talking about how House Ishkarat is closely allied with the Denerastus, much like the um, Firescale Moot, who operates out of the mountains that are to the east of Iopos, are also um, at the Skull Mountains, I think they are. Yeah. Like, also closely allied with the Denerastus, but the exact nature of that relationship and how closely they are related to the Denerastus. Are they a group that have thrown their lot in? Have they been manipulated the same way that the Denerastus have manipulated the citizenry of Iopos? Uh, is there something else going on? These are all open questions and could be fascinating to explore at some point in the future. Totally. But yeah, they're is a close relationship between the Ishkarat and the Denerastus, and the Ishkarat are a way by which the Denerastus are attempting to project force onto the Serpent River, because the Serpent River is, in a way, the lifeblood of Barsave. So much travel and trade happens upon it. It runs through the entire province. Most places are within a reasonably short travel to either the serpent itself or one of its major tributaries. tributaries. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there are some like kind of open plains areas in central bar save where you generally need to get through some pretty nasty terrain to get to the serpent river network, but still the amount of trade and travel that occurs on that is, is significant. And the Ishkarat threat, which is also a Denerastis threat is severe enough that it has prompted Care Eidolon, the working relationship between the Bloodwood and House Sirtis of the Serpent River, to try and keep House Ishkarat contained in the north reach of the Serpent. So, yeah, you know, there's a lot of that going on. Absolutely. So we've covered the Copper Branch, which is all about loyalty, the Silver Branch, which is about order, the Gold Branch, which is about success. Now we're on to the Oracalcum branch. And so the, like I said, these are the four metallurgical, uh, hence the metallurgical part of the, of the, the show opening. This is about protection. And these are the scales. This is the dinner elite personal bodyguard. They yes. Depths with blood magic, blood charms, and the blood magic is known, uh, only to the dinner clan about how their armor is literally grafted to their skin. And, these are also recruited from the silver branch uh, if they show extreme fealty and loyalty and so forth and so on. So yeah, this is the one they may not come in contact with unless you're doing something up close and personal with the Denerastus clan themselves because they don't leave their strongholds without a member of the Orichalcum branch to come with them. Yeah, these guys are not to be trifled with. They are absolutely high-powered physical combatants if they are not adepts, and many of them are, yeah, they are incredibly highly skilled and enhanced with blood charms and enchanted weapons and armor and stuff like that. Yeah. Boy, if these guys come on the scene, uh, things have, have gotten pretty serious. Yeah. And you're in deep, deep trouble. Because <laughs> again, they accompany the Denerastus, who are high level magicians. And these are at least, you know, seventh or eighth circle bodyguards. And so it's, you're in for an absolute knockdown, drag out, maybe total party kill fight. If you engage with the, uh, or a Calicum branch in any way, shape, manner or form. So do we want to talk about the broken keys? Yeah, this is a reference because I forget the exact publication order. I think the Theron empire book came before this one. And so the Theron Empire book, I could easily check. Yeah, Theron Empire was the book right before this one. Oh, gotcha. Okay. 
So the Theron Empire book, one of the provinces that is described in the Theron Empire book is the province of Indresia. Indresia, sorry. Yeah. Which is more or less present day Indian subcontinent. And it is inspired by the sort of British occupation, the British Raj period of historical yeah. India. And essentially that the Therans are kind of the, the the British Empire analog and kind of what's going on in Indriza is inspired by some of the stuff that was going on historically in that regard. Yeah. Won't get into that, but there is reference to an organization called the Broken Keys um, who claim to be or who claim to have been members of the the holders of trust. The the truth of what's going on with them is not clear. Whether they are just lying, whether they are connected with the Denerastus and the holders of trust in the past and no longer sort of have that active connection because it was broken during the scourge, or whether they are actually agents of the Denerastus who are there to do what the Denerastus do, which is try and get their fingers into everything and manipulate the societies that they come into contact with to their own benefit, ultimately to take control of it. Yeah. There's a paragraph in Secret Societies. There's a reference in the Theron Empire book. And and that's more or less it. I don't even recall now offhand whether they get mentioned in the Iopos source book at all. That's one of those like toss away references, potential future plot hooks that I think that was uh, out there that if, you know, future development of the Earth Online in first edition might have had them come into play somehow, but I don't know that they had any particular plans for them. It was just simply a, hey, the Denerastus are kind of shaping up to be our next big bad after the Therans get kicked out. Um, so let's put them in some other places where we might be able to use them if we want to. Absolutely fair. So we, we talked about all the different branches here, but we forgot to mention exactly how all of these branches get their initial recruits. And this is by the recruitment of the child tax or air quotes, the selection, which takes place yes. every summer in Iopos from children ages eight to 12. So this is your own little hunger games uh, type recruitment here. Uh, it's physical and mental games of skill. And this is how they get their uh, recruits to join whichever branch they, you know, probably looking for silver branch recruits more or less. Right. So I, a lot of that is described in a bit more detail in the Iopos source book. Yeah. You know, which goes into a, a little bit more about the, the day-to-day life and the way that things are within the city obviously a bunch of it taking inspiration from this original essay and some of the other information about the Denerastus and Aeopos that comes out in, in some of the early material. But Hunger Games is a is obviously, you know, this came long before the Hunger Games, but yeah. that is a good thing to look at. Like any kind of dystopian, like young people struggling in the face of conflicts to demonstrate their worth or whatever. Exactly you know, are, are all kind of uh, uh, appropriate. Because of the nature of life within the city and the cult of personality that is built up around the Denerastus, having one of your children succeed well enough in the selection to be chosen to serve the Denerastus, whether that ends up being as a member of the Silvers, whether that ends up being a servant in the palace, there is a certain amount of prestige that goes yep. along with that. It's cult behavior. Like you are you are removing children from their family yeah. and indoctrinating them. There's there's a lot of really dark stuff that is going on with the Denerastus and the way they operate the city. Yeah. You've got the typical kind of authoritarian proto-fascist regime oh, kind of thing going on. Coupled with the magical compulsions that exist within the city because of the magical abilities that the Denerastus have and the way that they can use the magic to compel people. You've got the, the Copper Branch, this force of intelligence gatherers that operate secretly and inform on their fellow citizens. You've got the Silvers, who are this public face of 
bright, shining, for lack of a better term, like paladin hood. Like they are yeah. the physical representation of the purity and idealism of Iopos as this force of power. Uh, you've got the um, the gold branch, which are the elite members of the family that go out and spread the word and project the power and manipulate things uh, among the enemies of Iopos, which is everybody. Yep. And the Orichalcum branch who go along with them to provide additional muscle and power. Yeah, it's it's all just a, a big old – they are fascinating uh, in their own way, but very – dark and twisted and evil yeah they are they are an evil regime the secrets behind them and why they are the way they are is ultimately on its own hand like authoritarianism itself in a way Mm -hmm. fucking petty (laughs) the reason that the denerastis are in charge of iopos the reason that the denerastis exist in the first place and why they are in charge of iopos ties into the dragons Mm -hmm. we spoil this in the in the gm's guide like this gets revealed this did not get revealed until the very end of first edition but that the denerastis are dragon kin that they are the offspring of a great dragon that was outcast yeah by uh dragon society and that he's basically doing what he is doing and manipulated them you know, and, and has basically shepherded them into being in the position that they are and doing what they are doing because he wants to show the rest of the great dragons that they were wrong for doing they did. what they did. So there's a little bit of hubris and narcissism behind yeah. Dinarassus' clan, too. <laughs> there's a very, uh, again, mustache-twirling villainy that that's kind of like, uh, on the one yeah. hand, that if it weren't so dark and evil would almost be funny yeah, like in a way comical sure to be lampooned it could be it it, it could be viewed I mean, in, in much the same way that alakia and the whole relationship between the, the dragons and the the immortal elves is so human and petty on some level mm-hmm. but because of the amount of power that they wield it is very it is also scary yeah. And that's what you're dealing with with the Denerastus and the holders of trust. It's petty and scary. <laughs> it is petty, which is amusing in its way, but it is also incredibly scary because of how much power they have and that it is being wielded rather than for the betterment of the world in general. It is being wielded for petty personal reasons, which is – wonderful and and stupid all at the same time and i say that in like the best way again alakia to go back to her because i love talking about her <laughs> is one of the most powerful and logical and knowledgeable beings on the planet is also incredibly human yes. in her own way yes flawed and we talked about this with the dragons as well when we were mm-hmm. talking about the dragons is that the dragons have personalities and they have flaws and foibles and noble intentions, but are ultimately capable of being, you know, manipulated and all the rest of that. Totally. And it's all just wonderful. Totally. So if, uh, if your player characters or your adventuring party goes into Iopos, they're likely not ever going to encounter adepts on their own. Because being an adept is kind of cause for suspicion by the by the clan as well. Because in Iopos, if you're a citizen there and you are discovered to be an adept, you are recruited into the ranks of the Silver Branch already. So you probably won't find any independently operating adepts in Iopos as citizens of Iopos. Yeah. So you know, at, at this point, we're getting into stuff that is a lot more in depth and is in the Iopos book. Yeah. Which maybe uh, somewhere down the line, we will do a, a bit more of an in-depth dive on that. Oh, yeah. But for the most part, when it comes to the holders of trust, the best way to use them, or the most common way that you are likely to use them, is to have the player characters get involved in thwarting one of their plans elsewhere in bar save. Yeah. Um, whatever that ends up being. The Denerastus, the Gold Branch, you know, will have stuff that they are going on where they are trying to sow discord and distrust between powers, but also to destabilize locations. 
as is sort of described in the the timeline, the history chapter, the what has gone before of the fourth edition Game Master's Guide, where the Denarastus take the opportunity of what's going on with the Second Theron War and some other stuff that they have been going to effectively take over Jarrus, initially kind of offering help, but then use that as an opportunity to leverage it for their own advantage. The story arcs within Empty Thrones all kind of relate to plots that the Denarastus members of the Gold Branch are undertaking in order to further the goals of the Denarastus. You know, we've talked about some of that when we talked about the um, the Force of the Eye, like what happened with that in terms of the development and, and the plot there. That's the most common situation that you will be likely, to, like in a typical campaign, that's yeah. how you would use the holders is mm -hmm. gold branch agents that are doing something and having local equivalents maybe of the silvers, but for the most part, it's finding out some kind of plot that's going on and thwarting it. And that could be just a, a single adventure. You could end up having that spin into a longer campaign arc where mm -hmm. the gold branch member becomes a, a long-term rival antagonist enemy for the group and might like start taking action directly against the player characters if they get to be too much of a nuisance. And that could eventually spin to dealing with potentially dealing with something in uh, uh, Iopos itself. But there's a lot of material in the Iopos book that you could draw on to get even more inspiration or whatever from that. Absolutely, which is why I love the fact that this this one essay spun out into two additional books in fourth edition, both the Iopos book and the Empty Thrones book. So if this is not enough for you in this podcast about this clan and, and the holders of trust, go pick up the Iopos book if you got the spare change uh, or the hold of the Empty Thrones book as well and really run, kind of run wild with your own authoritarian regime in one little corner of bar save. So... That being said, uh, that brings us to the end of this episode. We're almost 50 minutes in, and uh, if you have any questions for us about anything you've heard, email us at edsgpodcast at gmail.com. And don't forget that Ool is our beacon, our light, our all. And until next time, uh, don't be petty or scary with your own legend. Good night, everybody. Good night.